At 20 o'clock on the 27th of January 1940, we left Belgrade for a long journey, our way lay to dear France, to the battlefield. In war, no one chooses his own route, for war is not a tour. Together with me set off 45 young men who were eager to fight the Nazi occupers. At three o'clock in the morning, we arrived in Chaprija and were pleasantly surprised. Despite the late hour, we were met by many Czech settlers. They piled us with food rolls, and Melina Sholkova, a member of the local Sokol organization, handed me a letter addressed to all of us. We have come here to welcome you to fraternal Yugoslavia, she wrote, and to say goodbye to you. Who knows what awaits us as well? Perhaps we too will soon have to follow you. We wish you a happy journey. Say hello to all our fellow countrymen in France. It was very touching. Behind Skopje, before reaching Vils, a freight train with cattle derailed. The wrecked railway wagons, along with the cargo, sank into the waters of the overflowing Varda. These cows were being taken to Germany, the railwayman told me, so it's no pity. We said goodbye to hospitable Yugoslavia at the Gevdjelaja station. By evening, we were already in Thessaloniki, and in the morning after seven, we continued our way through Greece along the Rodo Mountains, in the north of the country, through the towns of Paranestian, Xanthi, Alexandrupolis. After the station of Pythium, we found ourselves in the European part of Turkey. In the west, the red ball of the sun was sinking towards the horizon. Flat houses climbed the steep and bare slopes of the mountains, and snowy peaks rose menacingly above them. The slender cypresses and a few mosques, reminiscent of former Turkish glory, were gradually sinking into the shade of the mountains and in the yellow-brown rays of sunset created a softly dreamy image of the region. After a full day's journey along the cool coast of the Sea of Marmara, we arrived in Istanbul about eight o'clock in the evening. We had two days to see the former Byzantine splendor. On the morning of the 31st of January, we took a steamer from Istanbul across the Bosphorus to the Asiatic side of the city to Haydar Pasha and started on the long journey by rail to Beirut. The endless highland plain beyond Skyser was deserted. The bare rocks and snow-covered mountain tops were pink in the rays of the setting sun. Beyond Ankara, all around was white, 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 the windows frosted over. In the morning, the sun illuminated the long crests of the rocky mountains. We were two thousand meters above sea level, and the mountains loomed even higher above us. Railway stations came into view after fifty kilometers. The first human habitation finally appeared on the wide snow-covered plain, shabby hovels, and all around was desert. Endless, bleak, without a single tree. I felt frost on my skin at the thought of being here alone with nature. Then our way lay through the powerful Antitorus Plateau, located at an altitude of more than 3,000 meters. Above us the tops of the peaks were lost in the mist, below us the mountains plunged into such deep abysses that it was breathtaking. Around noon all these gloomy beauties were left behind, and we found ourselves in a shining land reminiscent of a biblical landscape. Everything had changed, as if by magic. We were in seaside Adana. A caravan of camels walked past us leisurely. Oranges were ripening on the trees. In the distance, the sea glimmered in the gaps. At twenty o'clock, we pulled up at the station of the Syrian metropolis of Helib, in the mandated territory of France. Reverence for the French flag demanded that we salute it. This was our first meeting with representatives of an allied country which, although it had signed the Munich Agreement, was still at war with Hitler. I ordered everyone to line up on the platform. After a brief introductory speech, I exclaimed three times, Long live France, and almost burned with shame. The French officers, with their hands in their pockets and their cigarettes in the corners of their mouths, were frankly amused as they watched our ritual. Not a shadow of respect for an allied officer. They did not condescend even to respond in a dignified manner to the greeting. I retired to the carriage depressed. What did they think of us? 
It was then that my doubts about France began to dawn on me. Gradually the veil quickly began to fall from my eyes. At midnight we left for Homs. From there a small train took us up the Orontes Valley towards the highest peaks. About six o'clock in the morning I awoke to find that we were travelling through a stony yellow-brown desert. On the slopes of the mountains were whitewashed huts. Around eight in the morning at Bulbeck, we saw the ruins of the ancient colonnade of the Assyrian temple of Heliopolis, where, according to legend, was the cradle of mankind. The desert receded and the first fruit trees began to appear. In Ryak, in the valley, we felt spring in our souls and bodies. Here the vines are bent low to the ground and snake through the vineyard. Women carry water on their heads, in vessels resembling amphora. The men wear long white shirts that fall down to their ankles. They tie their heads with a white shawl tied with two black cords. On the left in a southern direction stretched the Antillavan mountain massif with a height of 2659 meters. On the right we were accompanied by the even higher and equally deserted mountain range of Lebanon with a white cap of eternal snows. From Editek Torek station, where the railway ends, we climbed with great difficulty up a jagged path to the mountainous border of Lebanon. From here we had a magnificent view of Beirut and the sea. We stood 2,000 meters above sea level. Snow lay all around us. The city was in bloom deep below, and the sea was blue in the distance. As we descended the steep western slopes of Lebanon, oranges and lemons were ripening in the valley and we could touch them by reaching out from the carriage. In the city, we were put up at the Paprika Pension. From here we had a marvellous view of the sea. On the 2nd of February 1940 our journey was over. On the 7th of February we were to sail for Marseilles. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. During the walk I observed a curious picture. In front of the guarded object I saw a sentry, comfortably sprawled on the lawn, and laying aside his rifle with a rope instead of a belt, this French soldier was lying guarding the warehouse. The soldier's contemptuous attitude towards the Lebanese population was striking. I was anxious to see what I would see in the French metropolis. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. On the morning of the 7th of February we raised anchors. Champollion, the colossus of the French Mediterranean Line, of 20,000 tons displacement, with nine Czechoslovak officers and 81 soldiers of the 12th Transport for France on board, headed for the location of the Czechoslovak unit. On the 8th of February, this swell steamer took on a cargo of an incredible number of bales of cotton at Alexandria and moved westward the same day. On the 12th of February, we entered Algiers for a short time, took on board wine, vegetable oil and some barrels, and in the evening set out into the open sea on a course for Marseilles. As we sailed, the smoothness of the water was like a mirror. The water was as still as mercury. The voyage promised to be calm, but there was excitement among the sailors. They were feverishly preparing something, and I could not understand what was troubling them. On the night of the 13th it became clear to me what they had been preparing for yesterday. I awoke to the wild leaps of the vessel. My stomach was rising to my throat and something was pushing it down. The huge ship was cracking at all the seams, creaking, groaning and wailing. We were caught in a good storm. The captain of the ship would say later that he had never seen such storms in twenty years. I was standing on the upper deck. The bow of the ship was rising menacingly and did not seem to be stopping in its motion. The angle of the ship's bow with the horizontal had already reached thirty degrees. The nose of the ship, like a monstrous ghost, rose into the sky. Then the huge ship slowly straightened up, and meter by meter its stern began to rise out of the water until it reached the same inclination as the bow a few seconds ago. When the ship, obeying the slow rhythm, straightened up again, a huge wave covered half the ship and rolled back to the bow. I climbed with effort, and not without risk, up the steep steps to the captain's command bridge above the upper deck. At that moment a terrible wave came in. 
It flooded the whole deck and crashed noisily on the bridge. For a minute nothing could be seen. The glass shattered and streams of water rushed in. But the worst of all were the blows of the raging sea against the side of the ship, sharp sudden. From such blows the ship tilted even more. Whoever did not hold on tightly at that moment risked to say goodbye to his life. The storm played with us as with a shell. Many of the crew crammed into cabins, where they were turned inside out. Of all our transports, Lieutenant Stanislav Ukitil, Lieutenant Polivka, Jerome Fransu, and myself were in good order. We could not look at the breathtaking picture of the raging sea. We wandered along the corridors, going fore and aft, shouting, teasing Neptune. And then the old man became furious. He struck the waves with his trident and jumped after him. That's when it started. We held on tight so that we wouldn't be swept away by the water or swept away by the whirlwind. But we did not get seasick. Perhaps it was the good advice of an experienced seafarer from Beirut to fill your stomach with solid food, drink nothing and eat oranges in large quantities. The wind whipped the waves mercilessly. Huge water swells grew to a height of twenty meters and rushed one after another into the wind. When they struck the vessel, the poor man shuddered with all his being, and it seemed as if he were about to give up. The avalanches of water were swept up by the whirlwind, forming great fountains of water, which were sprayed white into the air. All this reminded me of a blizzard in winter, when a storm lifts the snow from the surface of the earth. Here the sea rose up, and, like a mountain, stood next to our ship. I looked and wondered, how was it possible? Then the heavy vessel was on a high mountain of water, like a chapel on Mount Ruzip. The next moment we found ourselves again in a watery abyss, and the sea was terribly high above us, about to cover us with itself. How could it not swallow us up and crush us? And all this was accompanied by the howl and roar of the hurricane. But the storm had not yet reached its peak. The water was literally boiling, which made it more white than grey-green. A rainbow suddenly formed in the fine water dust, stayed above the water for a moment, and disappeared together with the rays of the sun that looked out for a few seconds. Inside our chamnalon looked very ugly. Chairs and chairs were belatedly tied up in the saloon, and the saloon resembled a hall in an abandoned castle. Every minute, something would fall with a clatter. Walking on a ship in such a storm is something to be endured, so I'm walking down the corridor. Suddenly, I feel something stop me. My raised foot hangs in the air, but I can't take a step. The next moment I'm flying forward, straight into the wall, as if I were being driven by an unknown force. Then it was as if someone grabbed me by the collar and gulp. I'm up on the next deck of the ship, and I can't understand how I got there. Suddenly, my legs start to shake. I have to work hard to overcome the heavy pressure from above. I see Captain Zuev try in vain to make his way round the cabin. He waits, holding on to a pole before he starts off, then aims at the next pole, says to himself, Gop, and rushes towards it. At that moment, there comes a mighty squall from the side, and I see the captain weighs past the saving pillar, waving his arms desperately and trying to keep his balance, and then prostrate himself against the opposite wall. After lunch, which was attended by very few people, we went to the smoking saloon. I saluted the captain of the ship, but at that moment a sudden jerk of the ship threw me into a chair, and so unluckily that I showed the captain my ass. Everyone was amused. Even the captain's favorite, the dachshund, grinned resentfully. She comfortably settled down on the sofa, and at sharp transverse inclinations of the ship she moved to the other end of the sofa, and then waited for the return movement of the ship to go back on the inclined plane of the sofa. It was obvious from her expression that she was enjoying it. Apparently, this was a special sea dachshund. We should have arrived in Marseilles in the evening, but the ship's speed has been halved due to the storm. We would arrive in Marseilles late. 
On the approach to Marseilles, I asked the captain if anyone had been saved in such a storm by the wreck. After some thought, he said, they could not have launched a lifeboat, and who would have tried to? And he didn't finish. On 14 February 1940, at 7.30 we entered the port. We set foot on the land of the coveted France. What France? Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Marseilles, city of flowers, fragrances and beautiful women. We had only a few hours of time. For customs inspection of the transport, we were taken from the port into the city, to the fortress of Fort St. Jean, the famous residence of the Foreign Legion. As I climbed the steep stone steps in the mighty fortress wall, I felt as if we were condemned and would not get out of here alive. Legionary non-commissioned officers were training new recruits in the courtyard of the fortress. To avoid the spectacle of the colonial education of the legionaries, I went to the mess hall where the surgeons wanted at all costs to get me drunk on Penuffis, a disgusting aniseed aperitif, which besides intoxication caused other worse effects. When I refused, they snorted contemptuously. We had one bloke, also a Czechoslovak officer. What a bloke! We pulled him out from under the table, said the surgeons with approval. In the evening, we travelled through Arles and Montpellier to act. On the way, a French colonel and his wife got into my compartment. From the first moment, I realized that we were undesirable to them. It was evident from their behavior and from the colonel's conversation with the conductor. We ate sardines and were not dressed con il fort. But there was nothing to do. We had tickets to first class. And what did they carry with them? I can't believe how much time the colonel took to get comfortable on the white cushions and under the thick blankets he had pulled out of his suitcases, and then I thought with a sigh that there was nothing to expect from these people to sympathize with our plight. They know only themselves. Their only concern is that their well-being and comfort should not be disturbed in any way. Long live France, but the France of the brave, the just and the wise. At midnight we reached the camp of the Czechoslovak unit. We were at the goal of our journey. Rue Molia. We were greeted by an old town with a pirate past. Medieval stone houses, humped pavements, cobblestone pavements. In the narrow alleys, where the shade always reigned, old women dressed in black walked slowly. A cat ran by. A two-horse carriage pulled by a skinny nag drove by with a loud clatter, and above it all stretched the glittering sky of the Bay of Lions. This is how the town of Agde was depicted on a postcard in the spring of 1940. The town had no sewerage system. Slop and sewage poured directly into the street. Running water was an unattainable dream. For the sake of hygiene, tin cans were used to dispose of the sewage which in the morning the local service took the contents out of town. In the 16th century, the town still lay on the sea, but the waters of the river Aero ensured that the sediments from the Sevens mountain range flowed further and further out to sea. Now Ag is located 10 kilometers from the coast. The people here have been used to the inconvenience for centuries and have not resisted the old ways. Agd would not be agged if it became different, more modern. Molia Street wouldn't be the most picturesque of narrow streets if it had more light. But how to live here? I was put up for the night in the station inn. In the morning, I hurried to the military camp and eagerly looked for the first Czechoslovak soldiers. But what I saw horrified me. They were dressed in colorful clothes from 1870 to 1914. Red cap, blue uniform, red trousers, only they were not given weapons. The military camp was outside the town. Fugitives from Spain used to live here. I saw several wooden buildings, each for about a hundred men. They were filthy, damp, insect-infested rooms. French and Czechoslovakian flags were flying at the entrance to the camp, which was surrounded by barbed wire. How do soldiers preparing for battle feel in such surroundings? Poor housing, of course, does not contribute to the strengthening of the spirit, 
but still it is not all. It's the determination to fight. I was eager to find out how the morale and combat training was in the Czechoslovakian unit. On the way to France, I thought more than once that in the Czechoslovak army abroad should be created quite different relations between commanders and soldiers than those that existed in it before Munich. People who had left their homes to fight for a new and better life were guided by higher ideals, and they had a right to expect that their commanders would also be in solidarity with these ideals, that the whole command staff would be imbued with a progressive spirit. It was no longer possible to keep the old concepts. During my first days in Agda, I met a caste of stupid and arrogant soldiers without imagination who caused irreparable damage to the personnel of the unit by their behavior. Day by day I became convinced that something is rotten in the Danish kingdom. What happened to the defenders of the homeland? They traveled here from far away, and when they reached their goal, they completely lost their fighting spirit. My compatriots were clearly depressed. They were depressed and uncommunicative. In a year and a half, the foundations on which the pre-Munich system of military discipline and morality had been maintained had crumbled. These things don't happen without reason. But it was as if the limited commanders did not see this. They still believed that strong ties within a military unit could be created by the flat authority of service regulations. They insulted the soldiers, disregarding their political awareness, which grew as the regime tightened. The soldiers of the Second Republic no longer stood mindlessly for the defense of a dead state. The terrible experience of history was not lost on the soldiers. They became characterized by a different political approach to the facts presented to them. Their perception became sharper. Their psychological reactions changed. In short, there was a need to replace commanders who were unable to adapt to the new conditions with more suitable ones. Honesty towards everyone and in everything was required. However, some officers could not understand these truths. They held on to their posts for some old merits. In the first hours of my stay in the camp I saw weaknesses. For example, how was the basic training conducted? Disgustingly the same, without regard to the meaning and purpose of this training, without a refreshing discharge. As if it was not a combat training, but just a muster in peacetime, somewhere in the yard of a barracks in a garrison in Czechoslovakia. It made me protest, and I felt bad for the soldiers. No wonder they showed no enthusiasm, no proud self-awareness. Not once did I hear anyone address the soldiers with heartfelt words, and in that difficult situation, idealists should have inspired the troops. You could call it something else. Political awareness, moral and political education, enlightenment. One way or another, but something must happen. I said to myself mentally, but what could happen here if nobody realized what was happening? I had spoken more than once to Vlado Clementis about the situation. He was a surgeon, I think. A man of few words, Vlado usually kept to himself, but we were unanimous in our assessment of the situation. The main blame lay with the system and the people who represented it. As we left our homeland, we agreed with friends in Prague how to convey the message of our safe arrival. Beginning on 22 February, Paris Radio broadcast a special message three days in a row that a Czech living in France had donated 133,000 francs to the national defence. This message meant that we were alive and well and safe. All this was then heard by our friends in Prague. My family was not yet with me in France at that time. At the end of February 1940, spring began here. The weather was like ours in May. The road on which I was walking was strewn with white almond petals. The meadows were already dry. The grass was green. Butterflies were flying. Birds were singing. In the vineyards, stretching as far away as the eye could see, Work was in full swing. In short, it was spring. In the sand among the dunes, I found a child's sandal. Just like my Milan's feet, I felt sad. On 29 February, in my new position as Chief of Staff of the Division Artillery, 
I visited the artillerymen at La Nouvelle and at Segan. I found the division in surprisingly good shape. The artillerymen were training with only one gun in the regiment, and the commander, Lieutenant Colonel Vislogul, told me how tenderly the soldiers treated their cannon, how they polished it to a shine. The artillerymen were in fighting shape, they were eager for battle, but they were depressed by the lack of guns and horses. Such a good condition of the unit was undoubtedly due to the efforts of the regimental commander. On 7 March, the soldiers of the 1st Czechoslovak Division took the oath of office at the Agda Stadium. From the fighting power of Czechoslovakia, 40 fully armed divisions before Munich, now remained only what could fit in the stadium of a small town. How simply and quickly our army was entirely liquidated, how hard and slow was borne one single division. The review began. Those who paraded in front of us resembled in no way the former Czechoslovak army. Twenty-year-old guys were walking sluggishly alongside forty-year-old tired miners from somewhere in Lille or Belgium. They walked with indifferent faces. The next day, the chief of the Czechoslovak military administration in France addressed the commanders. Addressing the commanders, he urged them first of all to pay attention to the morale of the soldiers, to maintain the closest ties with them, to seek opportunities to talk and speak sincerely without loud phrases. It was good to listen to this, but it had no practical result. It was necessary to start from the top. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The 10th of March was a memorable day for me. Members of my Belgrade group arrived here. We had parted then in Beirut. I got on another transport that was going to France earlier. Their turn came five weeks later. The guys tracked me down in the camp. At eight o'clock, we gathered under the banners. It's the kind of meeting you don't forget. They rushed towards me with joy. Mr. Major, you can't imagine what they did to us. We have not forgotten your words, which you said when parting, that we shall always remember what we are here for, and in any situation remain pure before our conscience. Form us into a military unit. With you we are ready to go even to the front line. Rest assured, we won't let you down. Private Necht, having heard that I would be appointed commander of the artillery division, told the others about it. Immediately, there were voices of those who wanted to join the artillery to be under my command. Many good things were said to me by my compatriots, and these dear words I remember to this day. I do not write about this for the sake of boasting, especially as I have no written proof of it. Those who have lived to this day, such as Polivka, Zeiss, Necht, Vimola, remember their words. Our meeting proved what kind of relationship could be achieved with the soldiers if the commanders in the camp behaved morally and politically differently than usual. As I walked home, I could still hear their words in my ears. With you we are ready to go even to the front line. Rest assured, we will not let you down. That was my best day as a member of the Czechoslovak army. On Sunday night, May my wife and children finally arrived in Marseilles. I was beginning to worry about them. They had barely had time to slip away as fascist Italy was preparing to attack France. The weather was glorious, the kind of weather only possible on the Côte d'Azur. The next day I took my family to Béziers. When we entered my flat it was midnight. At midnight all time ends and new time begins. Everything was different in my life. Rue Molio was transformed too, as if my mood had been transmitted to it. Sparkling with colorful colors, Rue Molio was full of spring charm. The city above the Seine. March came with sunshine and flowers. It was evident from the plain trees, too, that spring had arrived. The warm weather brought out the new spring clothes and the main street became a flower bed. What had seemed to me in the protectorate, an unrealizable dream had suddenly come true. Today, 20 March 1940, I left Béziers for Paris on a business trip. My train pulled away at 4 p.m. We traveled through Agde, stopped in the seaside town of Sete, then in Montpellier, and by evening we were met by names. 
where traces of the presence of the ancient Romans have been preserved. Already in darkness, we passed the jewel of southern France, Tarascon. At twenty o'clock, our Parisian fast arrived. In spite of the train's soft running and comfort, I could not sleep for a long time. Too many things were troubling me. Then sleep did close my eyelids. We stopped at a station. I wanted to lift the curtain to see where we were standing, but suddenly I stopped. The downed curtain warned, no curtains at night. You don't mess around with that in wartime. A strict prohibition, yet how politely worded. In my sleep, I couldn't recognize the places we were passing through. It was clear that it was not southern France. The landscape testified to that. Vineyards were replaced by arable land and spring crops. My heart ached. It all reminded me of home. Then the grey-green bent olive trees disappeared, and scattered groups of dark pine trees were no longer to be seen. Gone from the landscape were the mighty rows of spotted plane trees. Instead of them, in the fast flight of the train, fragile poplars, chestnuts, alders and fruit trees flashed outside the window. Then a forest appeared in the frame of the window, the first forest since my escape from Czechoslovakia. It was deciduous and seemed small, but it was still a forest. When was the last time I saw a forest? On 12 January 1940, when we said goodbye to our forests on the Moravian-Slovak border. Back then, forests were all around us. The buildings were different too. Instead of the flat tiled roofs and rough stone walls so typical of the Mediterranean region, whitewashed houses with peaked roofs flashed outside the window. These houses had no shutters, unlike the southern ones. Apparently, we were getting closer to our destination. At last we found ourselves under the arches of the Lyon railway station. The first thing I saw were the five letters Paris, and I felt very good at that moment. I could not contain my feelings of emotion at the sight of this one word, Paris, in Prague, when we, covered with a blanket, listened to radio programs from Paris. The very idea of suddenly finding oneself in the French capital seemed so incredible that no one seriously thought about it. And here I was. I stood on the platform and did not move from my seat, as if I feared that outside the station this sweet enchantment would end. The Paris of Louis, the Paris of the Great Revolution, the Paris of military genius, the Paris of royal, revolutionary, imperial and republican. How will you receive me? At the Czechoslovak military headquarters at Bordenais, I quickly ran errands to free myself for Paris. It's huge and beautiful. I've already realized that, and I'm awfully short of time, three days for everything. The chief of the department asked me about the situation in the division. I frankly said that I do not like the commanders, as they are inattentive to people, do not understand the soldiers, do not appreciate their spirit, born of good will to fight the Nazi occupiers. Such commanders know only how to order, forbid and punish, and believe that this strengthens discipline and morale. There is no fighting spirit in the unit and no trust, with few exceptions, in the higher commanders. Soldiers talk about the gulf between the army and the leadership. I outlined everything to the general. Let him finally know what they think of the old command system. In fact, I presented my point of view. The chief listened, nodded his head, then said that the most important thing is combat morale. It, they say, decides everything. In this, of course, he was right. Then I complained about the negligence of the French army authorities with regard to the material support of our artillery units. These units are not ready for combat for the foreseeable future, I said. In general, Mr. General listened to a lot of things from me. In conclusion, he said to me, General Viest is satisfied with your activities. I, for my part, could not say the same. Now Paris was waiting impatiently for me. I had only three days. From the Champ de Mars I walked slowly towards the Eiffel Tower, the symbol of Paris, the goal of all tourists. I have my own experiences with the Eiffel Tower. My friend Lieutenant Colonel Bedrich Beans, 
tragically died here. He was the Czechoslovak military attaché in Paris. He was haunted by the obsession that the Nazis were trying to kill him, and in the autumn of 1939, he threw himself off the Eiffel Tower. With a plan of Paris in my hands, I walked along the Seine embankment and once again felt the excitement that here I was, just like that here. Paris was blossoming and blooming, it was breathing spring. It was simply marvellous. The clock struck midnight when I was once again near the Eiffel Tower. The feelings overwhelmed me. The next day after breakfast, I went to the Palladies in Valides. The olive oil bagels were wonderful. Outside the building were old trophy cannons from God knows when. The boys were climbing on the cannon and trying to open the bolt. No one prevented them from doing so. Faded shreds of tattered standards. The victorious spoils of Napoleon's campaigns hung in the hall. And the commander himself lay here in Napoleon's chapel with a simple inscription of Lamartine on the tombstone. Here lies, nameless, and yet a name. The East Hall is packed with evidence of the faded military glory of the empire. Between 1914 and 1918, France was at the pinnacle of power and moral prestige. The more I looked closely at today's France, the more convinced I became that all of that was the case. The France of today is not burning with determination to rally to the fight against the enemy, to wage the heroic struggle for the freedom of the nation to the end. Have we not heard the blasphemous words in the South that northern France is not France, that it is better to live in slavery than to fight? What I saw in France did not correspond to the idea of a country which, with the Phrygian cap on its coat of arms, resolutely met with its breast the deadly threat from the north, preoccupied only with comfort and prosperity, carelessly indifferent and stupefied with defeatism. Such was the close-up view of France before me. Fame is a dangerous thing. It can be a grave digger. On Saturday, I continued my tour of the city. I looked with bewilderment at the happy corn people strolling along the Champs Elysees, for whom the war as if did not exist. People simply did not take it into account. As the French say, G mean fous. The Arc de Triomphe looked down from its victorious heights on these teeming crowds of cheerful people, unencumbered by anything and completely forgetting the warning of the unknown soldier of the 1914-1918 war. They would remember it when it was too late. The whole nailed boots of Hitler's hordes which in just three months' time will march here on parade, will immediately make the French realize how they have been dishonored. I wandered on my way and found myself in a small square, where a bench stood in the midst of the spring greenery. I sat down on it to rest. Suddenly, out of the blue, I remembered Agda, the suffering of the people there, and my friends from the Belgrade group. The atmosphere inspired me to express in verse what had been maturing in me for a long time. For lack of paper, I wrote all over the newspaper. As dusk was falling and the cold began to make itself felt, the poem, I believe, was ready. The poem was first published in the weekly magazine of the Czechoslovak Army in France, Our Army. It was recited in Czech and English during the voyage of the Mohand Ali El Kiba across the Atlantic, then on English soil, at Czechoslovak army meetings in Chester, Liverpool, Manchester, Whitchurch, at the former camp of Czechoslovak units in Leamington and other garrisons. It was printed in 1941 in London with a foreword by Frantisek Langer. On the morning of 25 March, I returned from Paris to Béziers. There is no victory in battles lost in advance. War was declared, but nothing happened. This strange war was soothing, lulling. Nothing will come of this strange war, people said. Then, on 10 May 1940, the real war began, but nothing was still being done either in the rear or behind the front lines. And what was being done did not serve the victory. It couldn't go on like this. I went to Montpellier, where the course command was. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I was received by Colonel Marchant, Chief of Artillery. 
Mr. Colonel, we have no guns, no horses. How are we going to do the training? I said, hardly able to control myself. Major, war is won by the calmness of the strong, said the colonel, and his eyes behind the glasses looked at me with absolute indifference. The colonel himself, however, did not possess the calm of the strong when he said this. I did not back down. Mr. Conal, we are practising on guns that don't exist. Our loaders stick an imaginary shell in the air. We have everything imaginary, imaginary. We came here to fight for our country, for France. Give us guns and horses, while there's still time. The main thing is to be calm, Major, nothing's happening yet. As I went to the door, the colonel silently, with his eyebrows furrowed, saw me off with an unfriendly look. What do you mean nothing is happening? There is fighting on the Machinot line. Soon the enemy will break through this mighty defence and his troops will pour through northern France into the interior of the country. And in the south of France, in the vicinity of the city of Bézier, the artillerymen of one allied division, will be doomed to watch the death of France in inaction. To the commander of the 1st Czechoslovak Division, I brought that day only new promises. In response, astonishment protests. It can't be. In the evening, we go home from the command post, by passing the crowded streets. Our paths take us around the outskirts of the town. We avoid busy places so as not to be seen by people who resent our indifference to the battle. After all, this is about saving France. The sad comedy of last autumn is repeated. Then the fear of the future, the menacing spectre of war, was stronger than the memory of former glory. Better slavery than war, everyone shouted and wrote. They were irritated by the patriotic mood of the Czechoslovaks on the day the war began. Their firmness they regarded as lack of peacefulness and their self-confidence as pride. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The French soldiers marched through the city as they wished, in disorderly crowds, dressed as they pleased. They were undisciplined. Some were reading a newspaper, some were talking loudly. One, two, three. Here's the Boshi. They shouted to the beat of the clear military step of the Czechoslovak unit they were passing. The soldiers dressed as they wished, civilian trousers and military gymnasts, civilian jackets and military trousers. They paid no attention to the officers, and the latter dissolved them even more, without reacting in any way to the complete breakdown of discipline. All military dignity was distorted. France is in danger. I don't give a damn. Freedom and democracy are in danger. I spit on it. Leave me alone. That was the root of the evil. The war was completely forgotten. And honor too. A handful of brave men couldn't save it. I have the honor to ask you. I have the honor to report to you. All honor in the formulas of politeness, but the actual honor was forgotten. After all, behind that honor, there was only a phrase, and it could not help the French and Czechoslovak soldiers who were betrayed in battle. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. We were sitting with Henry, a captain in the French army, in Béziers at the Café Corso. Here, too, the winemakers of the region were comfortably seated in wicker armchairs. With their hats pulled down over their foreheads, they sipped their obligatory aperitif. In wine was their politics, their hope and their fear. They knew only one front, which ran through the vineyards in the hills of southeastern France. The other France they did not know. The easy life was appealing. In wine, they found respite from their labours. The war for southern France. Yes, of course, it's worth it, but don't demand more. Henry remained loyal to his Pernofis. I just couldn't stand that muddy aniseed swill. Pernofis was drunk all over France. The Germans owned most of the shares in Pernod and Son. My dear fellow, where are you going with such morals on the Germans? Wait a bit, the captain answered me. When trouble comes, real trouble, you will know the French. When the trouble comes, Henry was talking about the psychology of the French soldier, trying to justify his belief that the French will redouble their militancy and will not retreat when the clouds of inevitable disaster loom over them. 
As the battles for the Maginot line go on, the captain still believes. He justifies them. The French are ordinary people, along with the advantages they have their shortcomings, in addition to strength, their weaknesses. They believe in the lucky star of France, and this allows them to go to everything, including the crisis of morality. Henry, can morality be introduced by fiat? No, no, I thought, your difficulties are not temporary, they are deep-rooted, they are dangerous and serious both in their immediate importance, in a moment of the greatest necessity, and in their far-reaching consequences. My attention was attracted by several French soldiers in the red and blue uniforms of the seventies. Like hungry wolves, they prowled round the garden of the café, casting greedy glances at plates and glasses. A soldier is paid fifty centimes a day, my mate said, just as much as a stamp on a letter to a sweetheart. Our eyes met. I read in the eyes of the soldiers that they would not fight for this society. I understood it well. We had put on the wrong card. With France, we won't defeat Hitler. French society had long been decaying without Hitler's direct influence. He only exploited its fatal weaknesses. In the sycamore alley of Béziers, under a blowing sky, the strolling public was buzzing. Young men and women were making their pre-Sunday lunch rituals. Near a large banner on which was written the data on the situation at the front in the Battle of France, there was a turn. Couple after couple turned their backs on the reports of the situation at the front and defiled upwards again towards the church. I didn't give a damn about that. In the north, they were losing the second battle of the Marne. But for these young people, northern France was not France. A faint whiff of wind carried to us the subtle scent of perfume. Then Paris fell. The front stopped briefly at the Loire. It was the last line of defence. The battle for France was approaching its bitter final. Only now at the front unknown from where began to arrive equipment, which was so lacking in the fighting units. Tanks, guns and other armaments were hurriedly sent to the front. Now suddenly, and one day from the Rhone Valley arrived to the Czechoslovak artillerymen and horses. A lot of horses, sick, skinny nags could hardly stand on their feet. They weren't even fit for meat. The harness was heavy on them and hung on them as if they were skeletons. It cut painfully into the open wounds in the long, ungroomed hair. With such ruins, we were to march against an enemy whose strength was speed and maneuverability. But it did not come to that. Someone issued weapons and vehicles from the depots too late. Too late, it was unfathomable, unbelievable, but it was a fact. Events were unfolding with catastrophic speed. On the one hand, highly mechanized, motorized Wehrmacht, guided by a well-developed theory of Blitzkrieg, on the other, suffocating, under-equipped French army with an old, insufficiently determined command, infected with fascist ideas. How else could all this have ended? What in the spring months of 1940, during the strange war, was only a premonition of approaching collapse, soon after the invasion of the Germans clearly spoke of the inevitable fall of France. Late, too late, the French began their common confession. We must learn obedience, discipline, and order, and do away with our evil genius, which is the suppression of truth and the perversion of facts, wrote the nationally inspired press. The Republic was murdered by cunning and swindlers who broke the laws, who rejected the rules of fair play, and who flattered themselves with the hope that they would be able to evade military conscription, parenthood, and the payment of taxes in short, any and all obligations. At the thought of our fallen, we must do away with our present way of life, wrote a prominent French figure at the time. We must do away with our gourmet inclinations, our sterile selfishness, our inability to calculate our existence without lofty ideals. What we were most deficient in was patriotism. We buried this central virtue in politics. We failed to realize that patriotism should be the basic trait of every Frenchman. Such was their belated confession. There is no victory in battles lost beforehand. 
the image of France in the twenties had long since been eroded by the decay of French society, which continued into the thirties. In spite of this, nothing was done in Czechoslovakia to set off the red alarm bells in full force. What image of France of those years did reporters, diplomats, writers, military men and tourists try to instill in us by glorifying its brilliant image on the basis of superficial observations alone? This image instilled in a generation a belief in the strength and inviolability of France's commitment to its central European allies, and it cost us Munich and all that followed in Czechoslovakia and throughout the world. And after all, all those observers and experts on France were obliged to warn us. This discovery was not so difficult to make. The signing of the Pact of Four and July 1933 signalled in the best possible way that this ally of ours was preparing to cede its position in Central and Eastern Europe to the fascist powers, Germany and Italy. Yet military men, reporters, diplomats and writers were silent. They sought victory in half-hearted battles, and collapse awaited them. The final hours, June 1940 was winding down, Hitler's officers strolled the Champs Elysees, and German panzer divisions were tearing towards the law after the fall of Paris. It was not as if the French army had proved capable of resisting the German advance on this last defensive line since it had been unable to hold the much more advantageous line of defence on the Marne and Seine. The way to the south of France was open. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Heavy trials are almost always preceded by weeks or even months of unclouded happiness in the life of a single person or a whole family. Or perhaps it only seems so afterwards, when people remember the days before the calamity. In those hard days that followed the days of happiness, I was in Beziers, preparing for the worst. I burned with determination not to leave, my family to be tortured by Hitler's executioners. The street was ringing with the merry clatter of children. Among their voices I could distinguish the voices of my sons. French children, running through the streets, were shouting loudly, Save France, the same as they had heard from their fathers. I lay in my room and listened, happy children. Is it possible that I could have done this? No one can make sense of one's own soul. Can a man be reborn in one night? It was hard for me. I called out what awaited me. Deep down I didn't believe it myself, or rather, I didn't want to believe it. But what use is it for a man to resist if he is driven somewhere by terrible forces? I had a hard road ahead of me, a very, very hard road. The situation demanded that I prepare for it. I had to prepare well, so as not to hesitate, not to give in, not to give up my position. Death is a phenomenon, an accident. The main thing is to live life honorably until the last minute. I lay there and thought about how I would do all this when the dreadful hour came. Could I have known then how everything would turn out, that France would be scraped and itself would be free in the Petanovian way? On the 15th of May, I was finally to receive a commander. Colonel Sklonovsky Bosi, after a long imprisonment in Budapest, together with Staff Captain Zor, were released and arrived in Agd via Beirut and Marseilles. I knew the colonel well from the military school in Prague and was looking forward to working together. At the first meeting, however, the colonel furrowed his brow and gave me an icy stare. He did not give me his hand, and asked me irritably about some officer. That was all he said to me. He behaved towards me in a cold and hostile manner. For some inexplicable reason, our relationship remained strained. I had not expected this and was amazed. After all, there was no reason for it on 15 May. Then one fine day the colonel, accompanied by a staff captain, left to check the combat readiness of the artillery units of the division without inviting me with him, although I was the chief of staff. Such a course of action was abnormal. As might be expected, the results of the check turned out to be unsatisfactory. These sad facts were known to the division commander. I personally reported them in Paris to the chief of the Czechoslovak military administration 
and to the unfriendly chief of artillery of the 16th Corps in Montpellier. However, nothing could be done. Without horses and guns, tactical exercises and live firing could not be conducted. Staff Camerton willingly accepted the post, from which the colonel, not thinking long, removed me. He very soon had to be convinced that miracles do not happen. Then it happened that, seeing the pace at which the Germans were advancing, I burnt, perhaps sooner than I should have done, some artillery service magazines, which were no good anyway. With good will, this could have been understood, but the colonel did not show it. It couldn't go on like this. Behind the empty desks of the offices, people were waiting for the situation to develop, waiting for the steamers that were to arrive, but nobody knew when it would happen and whether they would arrive at all. From nothing to do they were beating their heads. One thing was clear. The German tank divisions were moving unstoppably southwards. I prepared for the worst. I wanted to be closer to my family. I wanted to be with my family all the time during these hours. We lived three steps away from headquarters. When I once asked the colonel for permission to be with my family, he hissed, Go to your, to your family. There was a clear contempt in his words. He didn't understand my state of mind in those days. And then the ships came. Colonel Sklonovsky Bosi was not a kind man, and he caused me a lot of trouble when I was going through my difficult moments. Escape for the second time. Day after day passed, but no rescue came. 22 June 1940 at 1845 France and Germany signed an armistice. Hitler demanded that he be given every opportunity to continue to wage war against Britain. It was now to be expected that the French would also take some hostile action against their former ally. The worst thing that could happen to us was the transfer of Czechoslovak units and civilians to French prisoner of war camps. From there, the Gestapo would have raked us up on their own. But it didn't happen that way. On 23 June, the German panzer divisions had already penetrated deep south of the Loire. They could have been 300 kilometers away from us. Fortunately, the very next day for us came ships, which the British government hastily found at the request of President E. Benish and sent to French ports. The British destroyer Keppel entered the port of Sete to demonstrate British naval power here and to provide security for the loading. This was followed by transport ships. So, about noon on the 24th of June, we boarded the ship. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The long-awaited day had come. Already in the morning, everything was in full readiness in Béziers. At about nine o'clock, we got into the cars. We, too, crammed into our Ford and made our way to the assembly point. We drove through the streets of the city one last time. It was a flight from France. I felt sorry for her, but the deceived hopes and the bitterness of defeat, and what defeat, prevented me from admitting it. The day was glorious. The hot south French sky stretched above us. The sun was scorching mercilessly, and the coldness of south French indifference reigned around us. The column was forming at the southern edge of the city, on the motorway to Narbonne. About ten o'clock we trotted on our way. A long column of Czechoslovak soldiers stretched along the motorway towards the port of Sate. The French regarded our departure with proud indifference. We drove into Agde. The same Agde which, on 14 February 1940, I had embraced in an excess of happiness with my love for France. Today, we drove timidly through the ancient town as we fled France. The narrow Rue Molière swept by, and now we pass the buildings of the former camp of Czechoslovakian units. The flag is no longer flying there. Safe at last. We drove through the busy streets, and here came the crowded mole. It was already midday. The sun was blasting us mercilessly with the heat of Africa. In the harbour, Abandoned cargo ships were berthed. The French had disarmed us on the breakwater. What did they care if we wanted to keep fighting for a defeated France? We stepped onto a British destroyer. There was nowhere to turn, and the men kept coming. They were sitting on shells, on depth mines, on torpedo tubes. 
British sailors were arranging women and children, carrying away suitcases, serving light snacks, feeding dogs. They were omnipresent, silent, polite. Nearby, another ship was loading our luggage. Five hundred meters away from us stood another destroyer, a French one. The sailors were sitting on the deck with their legs overboard. They were dangling their feet over the water and laughing, laughing at our misfortune, at the tragedy of France. And they were watching what was happening on the Keppel. I approached the torpedo tubes of the British destroyer and was surprised to find that they were aimed at the French destroyer. We drew away from the breakwater and by a dexterous manoeuvre steamed out into the open sea, where a huge steamer stood at anchor. A faint smoke was rising from its chimney to the sky. Mohammed Ali El Kiba, with an English crew and an Egyptian flag on the mast, was waiting for us in the international waters in front of the harbour. Due to a strong wave, the manoeuvre of the capital from one side failed. We went round the Mohammed and moved to the PEM on the other side, this time successfully. It was not so easy to cross from the low and light destroyer to the big tall steamer. The sea was agitated and the sides of the vessels were coming together and going apart. The sailors gave the command at what minute to jump, with their help, of course. It was not without confusion and shouting. Then they threw our luggage. It was treated differently, and some things went to the bottom of the sea. And here we are on the Mohammed. Francisca was exhausted. I could read it in her eyes. The children were completely absorbed by the unusual events around them. There was no beauty in it. Several hundred people had crowded together on the steamer, and now they were all wandering about, blocking the gangways and gangways, disturbing the sailors, spinning helplessly about, running to and fro, and always looking for something. Some, like survivors of a shipwreck, sat on their belongings and looked silently, warily, at the commotion around them. Somebody said that we should worry about the cabins, and now they were all huddled round a small window, where a young naval officer was vainly fending off a hail of questions and demands. I was given a cabin in an annex on the upper deck. There were three bunks in the cabin. Francisca immediately started to organize a bed for the night, and I went with the children to explore. The running around on the decks and gangways gradually subsided. In leather armchairs and on sofas skeptics, who prefer to have a bird in the hand than a crane in the sky, took their positions. They won't budge, no matter how much gold you give them. The blue sky was without a single cloud. The air was heavy from the heat of midday. In the distance, on the shore, we could see a picturesque composition of houses framed by lush green vineyards, a scattering of harbour buildings on a dark blue background. And above it all the transparent sky was shining, radiating lazy carefreeness. This is how France appeared before us at parting. I would like to pity this beautiful country, but there were many things that the French offended themselves and their friends. There was no honesty, no courage, no old French honour. And all this was France's own fault. At dusk, the Keppel came up to us once more and handed the remnants of the Evacues on board to us. And again, there was a commotion on the ship, now even more so because it was getting dark. Darkness engulfed us completely. The big ship stood quietly still. Only the splashing of the waves against the side of the steamer and the sleepy rhythm of the muted machinery could be heard. The blackout was strictly observed. Life took refuge in the womb of the ship and settled on the decks. The ship dozed. The people fell asleep. The harbour lighthouse cut through the darkness from the shore. Swarms of city lights glowed. There was no longer a blackout. For them, the war was over. The lights on French soil wanted to be lights of peace and happiness. They shone so that the night would not seem so frightening. About 11 p.m., the splashing of the waves increased. Someone said we weren't sailing yet, that we'd be sailing in circles all night and wouldn't set off until morning. Submarines? The sea, however, below us was already making noise. The noise would subside 
and then suddenly intensify again as the waves came crashing in with a splash. The lights on the shore began to move. They moved away, disappeared, and again shone faintly through the thick darkness. For a long time, the beacon of France flashed to us, as if signalling SOS. Yes, yes, save their souls. The farewell to France was not difficult. We're on our way. Where to? Oran? Casablanca? England? Canada? Who knows? Will we make it? Repeat the order, came the voice of an officer in the darkness. Put only women and children in the boats. Men who disobey the order will be shot, clearly pronounces an invisible guard. Next to me, my wife and children were forgotten in a deep sleep, so we left the desired France. For seven whole years, Germany had been purposefully preparing to take revenge on France. Germany knew its strength and was determined to use it. France and Britain had only one alternative, to arm themselves in advance or to make an agreement with Germany. But an agreement was only possible with a strong France, an armed France. With notes of protest and empty negotiations, Hitler did not let himself be intimidated. Such a policy led inevitably to war. The military budget of Hitler's Germany was threateningly increasing and reaching astronomical figures. When the small states of Central and South Eastern Europe saw that France and England were doing nothing to stop the feverish arms race in the Third Empire, they began to seek protection in an alliance with Hitler or took refuge behind the shield of their neutrality. Both Western democracies surrendered Europe to Hitler. The bankers of the City of London feared for the fate of the loans they had made to Germany and in the naive belief that it was possible to trade with impunity with a country that honored treaties only as long as they were favorable to it, opened new loans. Out of fear of Bolshevism, influential circles in England were inclined to think that Nazism would protect them from revolution. All this was in Hitler's favor. The disgraceful Munich dictate was received in Paris and London with relief, moreover, even with delight. The diplomatic defeat was celebrated as a major victory. After Munich, the British woke up. Only the English, but not the French. We cannot allow Hitler to take possession of Europe. We must arm ourselves, was written and said in Britain. In March 1939, they took it seriously and announced recruitment into the British Army. Too late. The battle for France in the spring of 1940 had been lost as early as 1936 and the years preceding it. The roots of the defeat go very deep. At Locarno in 1925, the first step towards Munich was realized by the concerns of France and England. Both countries invited the Germans to the same table, prepared their entry into the League of Nations, signed the Rhine Pact with them and guaranteed Germany's western borders in it. Britain assumed the role of arbiter. Poland and Czechoslovakia were only able to conclude guarantee agreements with Germany, which, however, did not enter the arbitration system. Now both Slavic states found themselves face to face with an unreliable neighbor without sufficient guarantees. In so doing, France and England opened to the Germans the door to the east. Thus the great French alley first demonstrated its unreliability. Then in 1933 France and England signed the Pact of Four. Four powers, France, Britain, Italy and Germany, were preparing to share dominance over Europe. Of course, without the Soviet Union, rather even against it. Although the ratification of the pact, due to the resistance of the little intent and Poland and the outrage of the democratic French and British public, did not take place, the signature of France meant that this ally of ours was abandoning its mission as protector of small countries, was not avoiding the revision of the peace agreements to the detriment of the states of the little intent, and was preparing to abandon its position in Central and Southeastern Europe in favor of the fascist powers, Germany and Italy. In doing so, France greatly compromised itself in Central Europe. On 30 January 1933, Hitler came to power. In October, Germany left the disarmament conference and withdrew from the League of Nations, 
embarking on a path to regain its military and political power. The small nations of Central Europe drew the necessary conclusions from the spineless policies of France and Britain. On 26 January 1934, a German-Polish non-aggression pact was signed in Berlin. France lost its first ally. The first, but not the last, others followed. Germany was arming itself. There was still time to intervene, to put force against the threat of force, but the policy of appeasement of fascist dictators continued. Soviet diplomats from the rostrum of the League of Nations warned the West in vain against what was being prepared. Paris and London knew about it, but did not lift a finger. On 16 March 1935, the first bombshell exploded. Hitler declared universal conscription and began building the Wehrmacht at a rapid pace. In May, Marshal Tukhachevsky assessed the strength of the Germans with deep anxiety. France began to look for allies. But where to get them? Only in the East. However, the mere mention of this provoked sharp opposition from the right-wing parties. Only a French-Soviet treaty could improve the situation by giving an edge to the Allies. On 11 May, Pierre Lovell signed the treaty. But what kind of treaty was it if it was signed only to give the foreign minister an advantage in the negotiations in Berlin? And Lovell, before leaving for Moscow, asked the German ambassador to inform his government that he was prepared to break this treaty if it became necessary to conclude a more important agreement between France and Germany. And indeed, after the French Parliament had voted in favour of the French-Soviet Treaty and it had been ratified, nothing was done to see that the pact was carried out. France regarded it as a piece of paper from the beginning. On 7 March 1936, the second bomb exploded. Hitler's troops entered the demilitarized Rhineland. Now France had to take action if it wanted to protect its vital interests. However, when the question of French occupation of the Rhineland came up, Defence Minister Morin cautiously replied, If you declare mobilization, you will damage the morale of the army, because you know very well that you will do nothing. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief, General Gamelin, remarked on this occasion, The army can start military operations in six days. That was not true. The signatory countries of the Locarno Agreements were still conferring about German violations of the treaty and France, authorized to take immediately agreed military measures, was more and more inclined to a policy of waiting and negotiating. Before the replies of the participating countries reached Paris, the drama of March was over. Of all the moral weaknesses in the period between the two wars, the most serious and the most inexcusable was that France found herself unable to defend her vital interests and failed to block the remilitarization of the Rhineland. She allowed herself to be pushed into the background, which subsequently led to a deep decline in her prestige and power. Better to endure the humiliation of France by Germany than to undertake a military action involving risk. Such words could be heard in the salons of Paris and on the sidelines of Parliament. Accusation after accusation was hurled at the representatives of France for betraying her own interests and neglecting the obligations she had solemnly undertaken to protect the small peoples of Central and South Eastern Europe. It cost her dearly for not even defending herself. Belgium, harboring a deep distrust of France, withdrew from her old ally, denounced the agreement with France and Britain, and declared a policy of neutrality. By allowing Hitler to occupy the Rhineland, France gave him the opportunity to build the Siegfried Line and wedge himself between Czechoslovakia and France. Now many began to seek closer ties with Germany and away from France, and only Czechoslovakia remained France's loyal ally in Europe. For this loyalty it had to pay dearly. During the 15 years of the French-Czechoslovak Mutual Assistance Treaty, it was France's fault that the main staffs of both armies did not cooperate. Gamelin in 1937 rejected the last attempt of the Czechoslovak general staff to ensure the implementation of the military articles of the treaty, citing that this is a matter of political nature. 
and already Munich was approaching. After Munich, the system of alliance in Central Europe, on which France relied in its defence, was swept away. France lost the war first on the diplomatic and moral front, and then on the battlefield. The military consequences of the defeat were particularly severe for the French. A reckoning awaited France. The occupation of Paris by Hitler's hordes was only the first sip from the cup of bitterness, which was to be drunk by France and all those who together with her were guilty of the catastrophe. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The military reasons for the defeat, which led to such a rapid defeat, historians see in the wrong strategy, indecisive command, morale of the army and material unpreparedness of the French army for war with the Germans. However, the most fatal cause was the erroneous strategy of the high command led by General Gamelin. In contrast to Foch, the commander-in-chief was in favor of a defensive strategy, which did not solve anything and could not solve. The general's hesitation to take the offensive path against the German defenses in the West at a time when the German command was entirely occupied with the war with Poland, and left against France only a weak barrier on the unfinished Siegfried line, amounted to a new betrayal of France towards Poland. It was the most opportune moment to launch a general offensive. To delay became a criminal act. I will not start the war by a second Verdun, declared the general, and this statement was in complete contradiction to the strategic position of France and Germany. The general missed this chance and lost the war. He lost it also because he misunderstood the French defence strategy. He allowed himself to be taken by surprise. The left flank of the Maginot Line's fortified belt ended at Montmédy. A German invasion across the Belgian borders was prevented on the French side from Montmédy westwards to the sea by only weak covering units and the gendarmerie. The Belgian borders remained unfortified along their entire 300-kilometer length, except for light machine gun bunkers for five men located one or two kilometers apart. The sustainability of such differences was nil. In the future, the Germans, disregarding the Belgian neutrality, broke through on the border at Sedan, in 30 kilometers from the last fortification of the Maginot Line weak French defense, and began to move in a southwesterly direction. This breakthrough to the Germans facilitated the commander of the 9th French Army, already old and lazy General Corap, who, due to his slowness, failed in time to Zapocha forests of the Mars and destroyed bridges on the roads to Sedan and Miziers. But Rommel with his corps and tanks wasted no time and broke his way through the dense forests, which the French considered impassable for tanks. This was another unforgivable error of Gamelin's strategy. Once Fox aide Camelin forgot the marshal's admonition, which he had heard more than once from his lips, in time of war, do everything you can, use everything you have. Gamelin still had an opportunity to correct the mistake. Few people know that this opportunity was presented to France by the Czechoslovak intelligence service. About 10 days before 10 May 1940, the day of the breakthrough of the French front, the Czechoslovak military intelligence residence in Zurich received by mail from Germany a simple postcard with the correct address and innocuous text of an unknown sender. Dear uncle, wrote the author, I have returned from my trip. All is well with me. I hope to meet you soon. The signature was illegible. A detailed examination revealed that between the text on the postcard, invisible ink had drawn a strange pattern resembling the configuration of Belgium's borders with Germany and France. From the area of the Belgian-Dutch border, which was circled, there was a straight line to Sedan, and beyond this area, a wishbone, as is customary in military affairs, showed the transition to defence with the front to the south. From Sedan, there was already another line running northwestwards, all the way to the sea. This meant that in the area of Sedan, the arrows at right angles sharply change direction, from southwest to northwest, somewhere towards Dunkirk. Suspicious postcard with a special courier was sent from Switzerland to Paris, 
to Lieutenant Colonel General Staff Aldrich Tycom, who was in charge of the Paris residence. Then, by order of the Chief of the Special Group under President Benish in London, Colonel Moravec, the postcard was transferred to the Second Bureau of the French General Staff in Paris. The postcard was the subject of incredulous scrutiny, and Gamelin himself shook his head over it. They did not see the pure gold glittering before them. The representatives of the French High Command held, in their hands, in a condensed form, the entire plan of the German command, the plan of attack on France, although in schematic form, but it is absolutely accurate in the plan indicated the direction of the main strike, as it was conceived and how it was eventually and realized. The purpose of the strike was after the breakthrough at Sedan to turn the main attacking group of troops to the northwest, to the sea, to encircle and destroy the French and British armies drawn meanwhile in Belgium. Ten days had the French command to take effective countermeasures. But the French did not believe this report and did not take the necessary measures in time. When they then saw the German plan O deploy exactly as indicated in the postcard, it was too late. Crowds of refugees filled the motorway, and the reserve army was unable to move forward along the clogged communications to halt the enemy's advance. Such is the amazing story of a postcard that could have changed the course of the war. The author of this much important report was none other than the no one agent of Czechoslovakian intelligence, Paul Tummel. He had access to the highest political and military ranks and to documents of the most secret nature. He was present at meetings where such matters as the plan of attack on France were discussed and decided, and he was able to pass it on to our intelligence service. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. France was going to fall. The moral decay of French society, the decay in the army, economy, industry and government, as well as the loss of human values, could no longer be stopped. Military parades were held throughout the country to showcase the strength and tradition of the army. Brilliant troops paraded before admiring spectators whose hearts were filled with joy at the sight of such an army. Invincible. No match for the Germans. But the admiring spectators did not yet know that these best, bravest regiments would soon flee in panic from enemy tanks, whose armor French anti-tank guns could not penetrate. Finding themselves unarmed in front of the rapidly diving German aircraft, they will press into the ground in fear and ask themselves, where is the French aviation? On 3 September, the disagreement between Britain and France began. The Allied army was lost a minute this unfortunate war was launched, which the Germans had long prepared and into which France and England had entered completely unprepared. The army was defeated because France did not have enough aircraft, tanks, anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns, because there were no factories to produce so many weapons. The war was lost from the very beginning because the British ally did not have a large enough army at that time. Recruitment into the British Army was a sham. People signed up for the army, but there were no weapons, no equipment, and no officers to train them. So Britain was only able to send six divisions to France at the start of the war. Too few for them to tip the scales. Pilots died heroically in the air battles for France, but that was all they could do. Planes were desperately short and obsolete. The Germans had an edge in both quantity and quality. In the heat of ideological debate, both allies forgot that the enemy is Ant Portus. Weak government and lush blossoming bureaucracy contributed to the mass deaths of pilots to the greater glory of France. In 1936, when Hitler occupied the demilitarized Rhineland and finally decided to attack France, the monthly production of aircraft at all French enterprises was virtually zero. In 1937, the year before Munich, the production of combat aircraft increased compared to 1936 by an incredible amount, 38 machines, while the Germans produced more than a thousand of them every month. I don't give a damn. War broke out, but French and British soldiers had no enemy. There was no war as such. 
Allied soldiers spent the long winter months in wet shelters amidst liquid mud, without light, and inactivity ate up their energy and killed their morale. Why would soldiers sit here, in the cold, idle, if there was no war anyway? Then the soldiers were given something to do. They were given entertainment establishments to make them forget their troubles in the trenches. They fattened them up so they got fat. And in general, they were taken care of in every possible way. It's not so bad, this terrible war. But they forgot about the enemy. And he wasn't slumbering. He was getting ready to jump. And the fighting spirit of the Allied soldiers vanished like steam over a cauldron. They didn't believe in a German advance through Belgium. Why would the Germans attack this small country and thereby increase the number of their enemies? Why would they attack a well-armed and trained Belgian army? However, if we proceed from the assumption that Belgium is untouchable for Hitler, then there are only two possible battlefields in Europe, Holland and Romania, and because of them, the war will not break out. Long live peace, War averted. That was the judgment of strategists on both sides of the channel. And the tragedy began to unfold. What a certainty of victory. When Minister Bonnet, troubled about Poland, asked two generals, heads of departments in the Ministry of Defence, how France was prepared for war because he, Bonnet, had to know for sure whether to pursue a policy of containment with the Germans in order to buy time to arm France and save Poland. The two generals, independently of each other, replied that France was fully prepared. Well then, let's get on with it. But here, too, on the diplomatic front, France was defeated. How could these respectable representatives of the Ministry of Defence so assess the pathetic state of France's military preparations? How? The reason must be sought in the fact that they had lost their sense of responsibility, so anything was possible. Offensive weapons in 1940 became ten times more powerful and defences ten times weaker. And then came salvation. General Chauvinot, a teacher at a military school in Paris, came up with a reliable means of destroying the enemy. It is enough only to quickly build small concrete machine gun cells, and the invasion is over. Before the enemy captures one fortified line, it is possible to build the next one. The enemy will run into more and more new lines until he exhausts his forces, suffering losses. Then he will be driven back by the counter-attacks of the defenders. But Mr. General forgot one little thing. The enemy may have his own methods of quickly overcoming fortifications, and he may be so bold that after suppressing a number of machine-gun nests, having broken through the defenses, he will develop an attack on the flanks to the rear of the defensive positions. How easily French doctrines were bred. In reality it was so. The Germans never attacked the defensive line directly, but always sought to bypass it and take it in pincers. Only without bloody casualties, proclaimed Gormelin. France will not tolerate a second mass bloodletting, as was the case in 1914-1918 will replace slaughter with a war of science. A scientific war, strictly scientific. Because of this science, the French army went down to defeat. The general staff had carefully prepared for the Siegfried Line offensive in the spirit of strategy. Everything was calculated down to the last detail, counted the heavy and super heavy guns that will be required in the capture of German fortifications, ordered them in large numbers abroad but forgot about anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns, most of all needed to fight in the conditions of modern warfare. All this cost the French armed forces many lives and led to a crisis of confidence in the leadership. While the Germans were armed with first-class assault rifles and light machine guns, the French army fought with rifles. Even pistols for personal defence against paratroopers were not available. Pistols were ordered from Italy. The political and military leaders looked at the War of 1939-1940 to as they had looked at the War of 1914. Production and financial plans were made four or five years ahead. Plants were built which would not begin to carry out the war programs until 1941 or 1942. 
although production could be started immediately at existing plants, instead of urgently freeing up production capacity for other important war assignments by ordering machinery and weapons from the United States, this capacity was overloaded, and the peaceful pace of labor on the eve of war made matters worse. Bureaucracy was rampant. Skilled workers and engineers needed to produce aircraft, artillery and tanks were ripped from their jobs because of mobilization. As a result, Reynolds factories, which in peacetime had employed 30,000 people who could have played a crucial role in the production of tanks and armored personnel carriers, were left with an incomplete 8,000 after mobilization. Weeks and months passed before the workers and technicians returned to their machines and drawing boards. And then the Great Flood began. Refugees by the millions panicked to leave the threatened places and blocked all the roads in front of the retreating army so that any advance of military units became impossible. But it was enough to organize a few special units and allocate fighter planes with a special task to guard the roads and the worst could have been avoided. A disguised fifth column was also working. Only courage and decisive courageous response to the superior enemy forces had the prospect of success. 5,000 tanks and 10,000 aircraft, not produced in time, ruined France. It is difficult to fight against machines. Better the ordinary armament of the army during the war than the perfect and modern afterwards but even the ordinary armament was not enough. In a moment when fear and suffering drowned out love of country, French democracy revolted against itself and proved incapable of winning a military victory. The eight months of calm that Hitler gave the Allies were poorly utilized. In the end time was short everywhere. The motto calm, as a spell of initiative and activity, also played a part in the defeat calm down, was heard all the time. Whether the word was spoken aloud or in the mind, it was everywhere. Everything took time. That's what time was all about. Andrew Moru was right. It was so.